Uh, hi. Hi. Hey guys. Hey guys, live from UW, it's... Brainworks. 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 The show where we learn about the brain. With me, Nog in the Brain. Hi, welcome to Brainworks. My name's Eric Chudler. I'm a neuroscientist in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. I'm also the executive director of the Center for Neurotechnology. What all that means is I'm really interested in learning about the brain. On today's episode of Brainworks, we're going to be talking about... Hi, my name's Eric Chudler. My name's Eric. Welcome to Brainworks. Hi, my name's Eric Chudler. On today's episode of Brainworks, I'm really interested in learning about the brain. There's some fascinating research going on here at the University of Washington. Hi, my name's Eric Chudler. Welcome to Brainworks. Well, on this episode, we're really going to be talking about something that's really great. So this is about the new show? Is this about Ben falling asleep in class? You kind of spaced out there. We make our brains... Stronger. By having them sleep? By having them sleep? By having them sleep? Okay, what does that mean? I think it's this way. I think it's this one. Eric! 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 Eric. So, we're in algebra, right? And she's going on about quadratic whatevers. And this one starts snoring. Snoring? Yeah, snoring. Did she hear it? She looked pretty mad, like, yeah. It was intense, like, you're snoring. I don't snore. Dude, it's on YouTube. So he's snoring and she gets a smile. Weird. Right? So now we're watching Ben sleeping in algebra, the whole class. And snoring. Hey. It's trending. She didn't yell at you? I mean, that wasn't the first time you fell asleep in her class. Yeah, no. I mean, I don't remember. So we're all watching him, and then he lets out this beastly snore that almost wakes him up, but then he falls back asleep. He went back to sleep? Yeah, and she starts teaching again. What? Yeah, she just picks up where she left off, but like in a quieter voice. Serious? Not even the best part. Not even. She kept teaching till the end of the period, and Ben kept sleeping till the end of the period. That's crazy. Not even the craziest part. Not though. even, because then we all left our seats quiet as possible. And leave. Wait, you slept through two classes? Yeah. Yeah, he did. Well, then what happened? We went to lunch. So you woke up and everyone was just gone? No. Well, what do you mean? He kept sleeping. But you woke up in fifth period, right? I did not. No. He slept through fifth period and everyone left and then sixth period class slipped in. And by that time, someone got word to the yearbook. They didn't. Oh, yes, they did. And you were still sleeping? Apparently. He was. So, sixth period? Yeah, it started at the beginning of fourth, went through lunch, fifth period, and now school's literally almost over. And the yearbook photographer's on the way. But I woke up way before that. Do you want to tell her why? Sure. He woke up because someone tried to take a selfie with him. And that's when Miss Archer started yelling. Who tried to take a selfie with him? Who do you think? Elijah, seriously? Hey, I can't help the phone slipped out of my hand. Elijah. Anyway. Anyway, we told Eric and he said it would be a great idea for our next show. Because Ben slept through algebra? No, because Ben slept through algebra, lunch, and then two other math classes. So where are we going right now? Huh. I think it's this way. five buildings ago. Well, there can't be that many left. We've got to be getting closer. Hey, I think it's this one. What's the number on it? Hey, I think we're here. Otherwise, we should probably ask for directions. Oh, now you think we should ask for directions. I thought it was just the one building. Hey, guys, over here. Thanks for getting here so fast. Well, thanks for getting here. This is about the new show. Is this about Ben falling asleep in class? Well, no, but that's what gave me the idea. Hey, Ben, come over here and have a seat right over here. Would you
just gonna connect you to a few different things. Go ahead and hold this on your stomach. Yeah, that's good right there. And go ahead and hold this in your arm over there. Let me have this arm right here. I'm just gonna put a blood pressure cuff on you. Go ahead, we're gonna put this over on your head. And finally, let's put this on your head right over here. All right, I think we're ready to go. We're gonna start with this little survey. It's just a questionnaire that will ask you about your sleep, your general health, some of your habits. It will give us a better picture of your sleep health. Sleep health? Yeah, are you getting the amount of sleep you need for a person of your age? Look at all these questions. It's a test. A what? So, young man, what time do you typically go to bed? How long does it take you to fall asleep? Do you use an alarm clock? How many times do you wake up on a typical night? Do you have difficulty getting back to sleep? Do you get sleepy during the day, other than, you know, falling asleep in class? Do you text at night? I mean, that's wrong, but do you? Do you sleepwalk? No judgment. Do you watch TV in bed? Do you? Look, I was up all night studying for a test that morning, before algebra. This is all this is. Busted. Wow, Ben, all night? Yeah. Straight? Yeah. Did that, you know, help? Well, I thought everything would be fresh in my mind, you know, but I just had a hard time thinking. It's like all the thoughts in my brains were just running into dead ends. I couldn't concentrate. I was tired. So I fell asleep, obviously. Obviously. I couldn't remember what I studied that night. I also couldn't remember what I studied early that morning. Do you even remember taking the test? OK. So what Ben's describing is what happens when your brains don't get enough sleep. What I really want you to think about is we make our brains stronger by having them sleep. We make our brains... Stronger? By having them sleep? By having them sleep. Right. OK, what does that mean? Well, you're going to meet a few friends of mine here at the UW to find out the answer. We'll be able to ask them about dreams? Yeah, not only that, but you're going to do your own dream report. Excellent. Ready? Yeah. yeah. I've already texted you the directions. So let's go. Three, two, one. Hi, Teresa. I'm Jaden. Hey, Jaden. Hi, I'm Ben. Hi, Ben. And I hear you were up all night? Yeah. Studying? Yep. How'd that go? Uh, not too well. Come follow me. Let's talk about that. So Eric wanted us to learn more about sleep as teenagers. He told us that we make our brains stronger by having them sleep. And so we wanted to know what that means. Yeah, so sleep is really important for teenagers to remember things. It helps to, to retain facts. It's also important when you drive, right, and you're driving drowsy can be a cause of car accidents, especially for teenagers. And then thinking about impulse control or self-regulation, right, um, those are all, sleep can affect all those different aspects. We're just talking about resting though, right? Isn't that what happens when you go to sleep, your body's resting? Well, no, not exactly. Here's what you need to know about sleep. So you have two different types of sleep, your REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and your non-REM sleep, your deep sleep. And we cycle through those every 90 minutes. And REM sleep is really important for uh, memory, creativity, learning, alertness, vigilance. And when I look at uh, brainwave activities during REM sleep, it's super active. It almost looks like you're awake. And the difference is you have rolling eye movements. So that's one way we can distinguish REM sleep from awake. Whereas our deep sleep, non-REM sleep, there's three different types. There's stage one, drowsy but awake. Then there's stage two, where we spend a good chunk of our time asleep. And then there's stage three, which is deep sleep. And those brainwave activities look much different than REM sleep, they're bigger. And non-REM sleep is really important for um, physical health and restoration. So the take home point is that you need adequate amounts of sleep, eight to 10 hours each night. Once you lose sleep, you lose it. You don't make it up. So REM's a real thing? Yes, it is. Rapid eye movement. Ha, wait till I tell my dad. Why? He said it was a band. So when I stayed up that night, I'm missing out on two kinds of sleep? That's right. So when my brain doesn't get enough of those sleeps every day, what happens then? So when kids don't get enough sleep, it's a stressor for the body. And so that's going to affect how you're doing in school. So if you think about memory, your school performance, inattention, how you behave, some kids can get really restless and have a hard time paying attention. Other kids can get a little bit more anxious. It also increases your risk for obesity and then drowsy driving, which 
which can uh, cause car accidents. Whoops. So how much sleep do we need? How much sleep every night does a teenage body and brain need? A, four to five hours, B, five to seven hours, or C, eight to 10 hours? Stay tuned to find out the answer. This episode of BrainWorks was made possible by the generous support of the Barbara Snyder Endowed Fund for Sleep Innovation. How much sleep every night does a teenage body and brain need? A, four to five hours, B, five to seven hours, or C, eight to 10 hours? The answer is C, eight to 10 hours. Hi, so Eric wanted us to learn about sleep and what he said was, we make our brains stronger by having them sleep. And we're trying to figure out what that means. And what it has to do with us. Well, when my daughter was uh, getting to be a teenager, she, had, she went through a time when she just couldn't go to sleep, you know? I mean, she used to be able to easily go to sleep at nine, no problem, get up early, and then a switch went off and she couldn't go to sleep till earliest 11. And I'm also a high school teacher, and so I see kids in that early morning and they're just not with it yet. They're, they're just not able to be engaged as students. So when the sleep patterns we have as a kid changes, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So the change that happens during puberty is not necessarily a bad thing on its own. The problem was when your biology and society get into a conflict with each other. So when you go to bed is determined by your brain. But when you wake up is being determined by when the schools are starting. And so when your brain is telling you to go to bed later and school is telling you to wake up earlier, you end up getting into a fight where you're the loser. You're not sleeping enough. And not only that, but you can disrupt your circadian rhythm. And disrupting your circadian rhythms over time can have a lot of negative health effects. Cindy, Eric said he used to be a nurse practitioner. Did you work with kids? I did. I work with kids and I work with teenagers and what I can tell you about sleep deprivation it, is that it has really negative consequences on health. You see a lot of moodiness, um, increased risk for depression, anxiety, even suicidality, and then you have things like increased risk of car accidents. But can't we make up the sleep we need on weekends and like on the summer? You can make up some of the sleep that you need, but it's not like your sleep need is like a gas tank that you can fill up on the weekends and use throughout the week. No matter what, if you're not getting a sleep during the week, you're just not gonna make it up on the weekends and you're gonna still have some negative health outcomes. So I get that sleep's important at our age, but what makes our sleep different from adults? Well, here's how it works. Every human being on the planet has an internal clock, whether you notice it or not, that's always running. We call this clock your circadian rhythm, and it's located in a small bundle of cells inside your brain. These 20,000 cells make up what's known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN, and it's what helps you time your biological functions so that you're in sync with the environment. Now there's clocks all over your body that help you figure out when to sleep, when to wake up, when to eat, how, when you're gonna be the most active, or when you're gonna do the best in school. And this clock in your brain acts like a little conductor, conducting all the orchestra for the parts of your body together so you stay in sync with your environment. So wait, you're saying there's a clock, like an app that tells time, but you're also saying there's a clock in our heads that tells time? Are you talking about circadian rhythms? Wait, what's a circadian rhythm? What's a circadian rhythm? A, a folk dance, B, the clock in our brain that synchronizes our body with our environment, or C, an irregular heartbeat first identified by Dr. Charles Circadian. Stay tuned to find out the answer. The additional program support provided by the Dana Foundation, your gateway to responsible information about the brain. More at Dana.org. What's a circadian rhythm? A, a folk dance, B, the clock in our brain that synchronizes our body with our environment, or C, an irregular heartbeat first identified by Dr. Charles Circadian. The answer is B, the clock in our brain that synchronizes our body with our environment.
so my brain needs eight to 10 hours of sleep. And you got? Zero. And? I couldn't remember anything. Were you really studying the whole time? Pretty much. I was studying and trying to stay awake. What does that mean? Well, I was on my laptop most of the time. Sometimes if I had a question, I'd text a friend from class and ask about it. And how were you trying to stay awake? Xbox. One way sleep researchers learn about sleep and our brains is by monitoring brain activity while we sleep. This means attaching electrodes to record eye movement and brain electrical patterns. So when we're asleep, the monitors don't flatline? No, let me show you. Ben, look up. When Ben moves his eyes, the electrodes monitoring his eye movement respond to that physical activity, even with his eyelids closed. Physical movements like blinking or grinding teeth are detected by other electrodes attached to Ben. Dreams show up here too, and all these electrical patterns cycling through stages overnight can show researchers whether or not we're getting healthy sleep. And what does it look like when we're awake? Actually, when we're awake, it looks a lot like REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep, a lot of brain activity. And what distinguishes wake from REM sleep are these leads here, these rolling eye movements, which is why we put one on each eye or next to each eye for Ben. So when I stayed up the other night, I missed out on two kinds of sleep. How does that work again? Yeah, so you missed um, your REM sleep and your non-REM sleep, and both of those types of sleep are really important for creativity, learning, remembering facts, um, how you do well in school, your cognition, your attention, and how you interact with your friends, your parents. Both types of sleep are really important for learning, memory, and creativity, and how we interact with folks. Wow, I guess I didn't do myself any favors staying up all night. Okay, so what I don't get is, what do the circadian rhythms have to do with school again? The science is clear that once you hit puberty, then your whole brain sleep changes and you really can't get to sleep much before 11. It's a hormone thing. It's not that you're lazy. And teens actually need more sleep than adults. And so that pushes when you wake up even later in the mornings. So when we have schools starting early, we're putting teenagers in between these two competing forces. Your biology telling you to go to sleep later and wake up later, but society telling you to wake up really early to get to school. So you had Eric give us some watches to wear a week ago. What was that all about? Well, a couple of years ago, the Seattle Public School Board voted to delay the start times from 7.50 to 8.45 in the morning. And my advisor and I, Horacio de la Iglesia, decided this would be a really good opportunity for us to perform what's called a natural experiment. And so we took watches like this and the one that I gave you, and we put them on students to see how are they sleeping before and after the school start times were delayed. And along with some collaborators like the school board, some local teachers, and some others, we were able to also look at things like attendance, academic performance, and some other variables that we thought might be really interesting to see as a result. So what'd you find out? Well, in our study, we were- No, what'd see... you find out about us? Oh, well, let's take a look. Uh-oh. It looks like your friend Ben here pulled an all-nighter and then didn't go to school. Oh, he went to school. So he slept through school? Pretty much. <sighs> so what happened to the students in your study? Well, here's what we found. When the schools were delayed from 7.50 to 8.45, there were a number of really cool things that happened with our students. First, and probably the most important, is they were sleeping more. While they were going to bed at the same time as students in the early start time, the fact that the schools were delayed allowed them to sleep in in the mornings, so they were able to sleep more overall every single night. In addition, they were doing better in school. We found that their grades improved after the delay. They were also less tired, and in some cases, they were getting to school on time more often. Often. Students also had fewer first period absences and tardies, but only in the school researchers identified as less economically advantaged. Why is that? What are the differences between the schools that make a difference? For scientists, the data points at new questions to ask and understand, hopefully to help all students develop stronger brains. 
Prior to the change in our start times, my first period students were making all kinds of silly mistakes. They were operating through a fog. They just were not firing on all cylinders yet. Students would come in late. It was very disorganized. And um, once we moved to a later start time, things really improved. Students are a lot more engaged. And I heard from parents things like, we have our kids back. They're not zombies. So the extra sleep made students' brains stronger. When our sleep habits match what our bodies need, A, we don't need as much sleep. B, we remember dreams more easily. Or C, we make our brains stronger. Stay tuned to find out the answer. This episode of BrainWorks was made possible by the generous support of the Barbara Snyder Endowed Fund for Sleep Innovation. When our sleep habits match what our bodies need, A, we don't need as much sleep, B, we remember dreams more easily, or C, we make our brains stronger. The answer is C, we make our brains stronger. We'll be able to ask them about dreams. You're going to do your own dream report. Dream report. Dream report. Dream report. Dream report. Okay. While we're learning about healthy sleep, one of the things we're all super interested in was dreams. Like, why do we dream? Why is this happening in my dream? Why? Why? Or why is Eric dreaming about this? And what's the deal with flying dreams? But really, why do we dream? So we asked Eric. Hey Eric, why do we dream? It's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's a complicated answer. We don't actually know, but here's what we do know. We know that brain activity during REM sleep looks a lot like brain activity when you're awake. And we know that during non-REM sleep, our bodies can move freely. Which means, for those of us who find ourselves sleepwalking, we're not acting out a dream we're having right then. Okay, last thing. In general, we don't remember our dreams when we wake up from non-REM sleep. But we do remember our dreams when we wake up from REM sleep. Now even though we're still wondering why we dream, Eric told us we can explore the question of dreams ourselves. We can go to his website right here, Neuroscience for Kids, download a sleep log and a dream log, and start keeping a record of the sleep we get and the dreams we have. And later, we can look at the data to see if we can find patterns that might lead to an answer. Or maybe the patterns we find will help us ask better questions. Don't worry about remembering all of your dreams, but write down the ones you do remember just as soon as you wake up. Whee! Because the more you write down your dreams, the better you get at remembering them. Yeah, I jet like myself the other day. But we're not talking about random all-nighters, right? We're talking about what your brain needs every day. Right, what your brain needs every day. So thinking about sleep the same amount, even if it's on the weekends and the weekdays, you need the same amount. You don't make up sleep. Okay, once you lose it, you lose it. So be really consistent with your bedtime routine, what you do prior to bed, and your wake-up routine. We make our brains stronger by having them sleep. Yeah, sleep's really important for creativity and learning and memory and behavior. So thinking about sleep and what you're doing to get good sleep, removing your iPad, your iPhone, the TV from the room. Well, thank you so much for having us and helping us about the sleep and brain today. Thanks. You're welcome. I enjoyed meeting you, teaching you about sleep. Thank you for your time.
So we're talking about the everyday sleep we need, not just weekends or vacations, like we can't make it up later. Exactly right. Remember, when you go through puberty, your sleep schedule changes. You're just naturally going to want to go to bed later and wake up later, and that's okay. What we need are school start times that help reflect the changes that happen to your biology, so you can get those 8 to 10 hours of sleep that your body really needs during this time. You have to value sleep. You have to understand that it's really important for your health and for your learning. And one really crucial thing is turn off those devices and those phones a good hour before so that your brain can really start to slow down and then you will have a much better time sleeping. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And for answering our questions. So what did you guys learn? Sleep is crucial to learning and memory. Our sleep patterns are layered because of the biological clock in our brains. We need at least eight hours of sleep every night and healthy sleep habits. And we make our brains stronger by having them sleep. There you go. Hey, I've got a question I forgot to ask in the sleep lab. Yeah, sure. So Teresa showed us EEG wave patterns of people who are in REM sleep and people who are awake. And those patterns are similar, right? Yeah. Not long after REM sleep was discovered, it was called paradoxical sleep. And that's because the brain is really active, but the muscles are paralyzed and you can't move. So if you're in REM sleep, to your brain there's not a lot of difference between being awake and being asleep. Yeah, sure. Because the brain activity is similar? Yes, on the EEG it is. So as far as my own brain goes, I could be dreaming right now? Well, you could, but, but you're not. Or Eric, you could be the one dreaming right now. Hi, my name's Eric Chudler. My name's Eric. Welcome to BrainWorks. Hi, my name's Eric Chudler. On today's episode of BrainWorks. You don't make up sleep. You have to value sleep. We make our brains stronger. By having them sleep? By having them sleep? By having them sleep? Okay, once you lose it, you lose it. You're not sleeping enough. You're not so sleeping enough. Eric. Uh, come in. Whoa, were you just sleeping? Uh, yes. You want us to come back? No, I've actually got a lot more to tell you about than I thought I did. Before you do that, you are not going to believe the story these guys just told me. Jenna? So, we're in algebra, right? And then Ben falls asleep, right? Yeah. And he sleeps all the way through lunch? Yeah. And then Elijah gets yelled at? Yes. Wait, how did you know those things? 